I would say that regardless of how big the bet is, we always we always start very very small. Always. That's just if it is a big bigger bet, there is a bigger risk. Because if you if you take a bigger swing and you you know miss hard, that is even a bigger business impact. Hello and welcome to Experimentation Masters, the leading resource for business experimentation. Join fellow innovators, strategists and entrepreneurs to learn practical tips, methods and techniques from world-leading experts in experimentation. Design better experiments, lead with more confidence and have greater impact in your organization. Now please welcome your host, Gavin Bryant. Hello and welcome to the Experimentation Masters podcast. Today, I would like to welcome Vishal Kapoor to the show. Vishal is Director of Product at Shipt, a high growth delivery marketplace that facilitates same day grocery deliveries. More than 300,000 Shipt shoppers deliver customer orders across the United States. We're Shipt valued at $15 billion with revenues of more than $1 billion per annum. Prior to Shipped, Vishal was Lead Product Manager, Marketplace Pricing and Intelligence at Lyft, and also led growth of Words with Friends at Zynga. Vishal has also held roles at Amazon, Microsoft, and Yahoo. In this episode, we're going to discuss marketplace experimentation from zero to one. Welcome to the show, Vishal. Thanks, Gavin. I'm very excited to be here. Now, a little bit of preamble for our audience. Uh, in this episode of the podcast, I'm going to try something a little bit different. Uh, this episode will feel more like a hybrid podcast slash webinar. So think of it as an experiment on the Experimentation Masters podcast, if you like. As always, I welcome your feedback on any of the episodes. We felt that this format would maximize value for the audience better as we'll be stepping through a practical experimentation scenario today. Vishal has kindly prepared some slides to accompany our discussion. To access the slides, head over to the First Principles website at firstprinciples.ventures, then podcast and Vishal Kapoor episode. I'll also be posting this episode on YouTube you can access the episode on the First Principles Experimentation channel. Vishal, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thanks for having me. Let's talk about whether we can do something better. We have, so far, we have not talked about our biggest state, our biggest market, which is New York. Let's bring that into the mix and see if we can potentially create something or, or create an analysis technique where we can make the analysis a little more robust, right? By, by taking different... So in, in California, we said, you know, there was some external impact. Some celebrity released a book. So California metrics were elevated. Can we actually do something where we can uh, kind of bulletproof ourselves against, against that effect, that external effect on the control, especially the control, not the variant, but the control. Can we actually bulletproof the control a little bit, make it more immune? Uh, to external effects uh, that may happen in, in, you know, in the, in the, when we are doing the, doing the test and the comparison, can we make it more immune? That this technique is actually called creating a synthetic control. And what this does is really, it uses different, and this is typically used in geographical context, but that doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be used in a, in a temporal context. You could use different slices in time. Uh, but generally, this is done in geographical context. It's just easier. What, what this shows is that uh, what it will do is can be used more than more markets with California to create a control which is more robust against external interference, against external biases. So here, for example, what we would do is, we, we, we know this, right, from any, without making any change, the unweighted sales in, in our variant in Washington, the chosen, the chosen state, they were 40K. In California, let's say that was, now we are making a synthetic control. So in California, your sales were 60K. In New York, your sales were 100K. Let's say, can we create a control so that the effective sales are actually the same? So we, we, for, for the variant, all of your data is your, is your, is your, is your all of your data is you know, of in the variant. So all the sales are in the variant, all the 40,000 books. The weight is 100%. But in California, 
uh, you basically take 30, 37.5% of that, of the total sales. So, you know, 60 over 160. And in New York, you take 63% of that. So this is a very made up example. But what, what really what we're doing here is we are now not comparing only with California. We are diminishing the weight of California in control. Really, that's what we're trying to do. And we are trying to bring New York as another, another example. In the real world, what will happen is, Gavin, we will basically have, so you can see the, the you know, the, in, in terms of weighted sales, if you, if you use our percentages, left side is 40K, right side is also now 40K. Assuming sales is our metric that we are measuring on, you create a synthetic control on that metric by using many, many geos. This, is, this example just shows us two. But you, in the real world, it's usually a combination of, you know, 15, 20, 25, up to 20 by 30, like any number of geographies, any number of markets. The idea is to create a combination with, you know, this kind of a weighted combination of different markets. So if something external happens in a market, it's actually unlikely to throw the average off. So now when you're measuring Washington against that, you know that nothing went wrong in control. Nothing external went wrong in control. And now you can be more sure that Washington is probably the lift you're seeing in Washington is a true change versus the synthetic control because it's difficult to move synthetic control. It's difficult, it's, it's difficult to have an external effect in all the geographies which comprise the synthetic control, if that makes sense. So that's generally the technique that's used. Right? So, so we do that. Uh, you know, now what we're saying is, okay, instead of looking at only California, we are going to look at 14, 48,000 sales in, in California. Uh, sorry. In, instead of looking at entire California, we're going to look, look at about 15,000 sales in California and about 25,000 sales in New York, or combine that, only take that, the sales are happening, we will take, you know, percentage of what was the revenue for that percentage of the scale of the sales, 14.8,000 of the sales, what was the revenue? We will take a percentage of, out of all the 100,000 sales in, in New York, what was the percentage, what, what was the sales for 25.2? Construct that, and that is our compar comparison number. Now, if, if for California, if that went up, that wouldn't have such a large effect. Right, as versus before, it, it just had a very, very large effect. It wouldn't have such a large effect in this example. So that's fine. Uh, it is more robust than doing a pure geo versus geo test, right? Comparing one state to the other, uh, it is it's it's better. And the good news is it doesn't quite need similar trends. Uh, it doesn't quite need it. Meaning you can you can construct a control over a period of time uh, that can mimic. Well, it mimics similar trends. It doesn't need them to, co to construct a sy synthetic control. It just mimics the same sales trends. That's, that's the goal here. But the problem, again, is that it cannot discount for effects. So now it is, it is making your control more robust, which is good. But that doesn't discount. It cannot make your variant more robust, unfortunately. So in Washington now, what if a competitor closed all their stores in Washington, causing an inflation in Washington sales? That's still something that we have not accounted for, right, through this technique. Um, in practice, the way you can, maybe the way you can work around this, if you don't have a more sophisticated way of experimentation, the, the way in which you can work around this is use multiple states, use Washington, use, you know, Nevada, use something else, uh, you know, where you have multiple states or multiple cities. And then you know that directionally, at least, you know, uh, if you have a very high lift in sales, right? If you have like a five, 10% lift in sales, which is pretty, which sounds pretty high. And that happens in at least two out of three states. You directionally know. Uh, if, if it happens in all the states, then I think you can be more confident. Just, just, you know, get more data. You can be more confident that it's not a fluke. It's not by noise that it only happened in Washington because something happened in Washington which elevated Washington's result. So you can kind of discount for that. Using synthetic control is a technique. Using multiple variants is a technique where you can actually make Somewhat reliable. This is this is called quasi experimentation, by the way. In in the real world, they don't call this an experimentation technique. It's a quasi experiment, not fully scientific, but still you are a little bit better off than everything we have seen so far. So people use that in the real world, in the absence of you know creating some more advanced tests, which we will see in a in a minute. This is still something that is a healthy balance to make some launch decisions. Um, you know, if you if you want to. Uh, run your business this way. This is this is not as bad as the ones that we saw before. And I think one of the examples here, just to close this out, is uh, this was used to analyze the effect of uh, usage of cigarettes, cigarette smoking, because of sales tax in California. And this, in I, I'm in California, so uh, there was a proposition released here. There was a law released called uh, Proposition 99, 
and there was a sales tax introduced because of that. What was the drop in uh, the smoking rates in California? And the way they did that was they looked at smoking rates in a lot of other states in the U.S. and created a synthetic control. And only in California, they applied the tax. And then they basically compared uh, what was the change in California versus, uh, you know, versus, uh, versus, you know, these other states, this control, which was synthetically created. It kind of, again, as I said, it kind of makes it more robust versus just relying on one state versus the others. All right. I think with that, with that, we will come to one of the uh, testing techniques that is probably the most popular <laughs> uh, and, you know, the most widely used in the industry. Um, Gavin, have you heard of an A-B test before or an A-B-N test? Uh, just, just once or twice. Just once or twice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So an A-B test, truly an A-B test is, this is, I would say, is the, is the one technique, uh, you know, that is used that is used far and wide in most of the technology companies. So if my audience wants to walk away with, you know, two, two insights in this, uh, uh, you know, out of this presentation, I would ask them to focus on this and then I would ask them to focus on the next one. The next one is far more complicated to execute, but that is truly the one that we, that is the latest and the greatest technique that we use in marketplaces. So we'll come to that. But this is, this is fairly, fairly statistically, uh, this is fairly data driven. There is high statistical confidence. There is this is a this is a technique that is used for a lot of business decision making. So this is something that I I would love for my audience to you know um, you know read more about, educate themselves about what is an A/B test, what is an A/B/N test. So let's let's take that example forward, right? So so suppose in this example, uh, now you take two books, right? You take a book A and you take a book B with similar weekly sales. Both the books have the same weekly sales. Uh, and in the variant, what you're saying is, so remember we said that in the, public, the publisher sells many books, right, across three different states. You pick two books with similar weekly sales. They sell about the same books per week. In the variant, you drop the price of one book, which is book A, to $1.9. So remember, your hypothesis is to test that the drop actually increases sales, right? It doesn't mean you have to, you have to experiment on, on your whole state it doesn't mean you have to experiment on your whole stores. It can actually mean you can experiment on a single book title, right? Which is really, Gavin, the reason I say that this is, this again kind of, you know, shines light on the previous point I was making. You would rather experiment on one or two books versus actually doing it across an entire state. Like if this works, then this is a good, it's, it's the least costly for us to, to actually make it happen. This is the reason why this is the most popular as well. So you drop the price of one book, you know, $2.09. And next week, uh, what you see is that the, the sales of that book A versus B are now up by 10%. Now, this is fairly, this feels like, you know, there are two books in the same store, in the same state, you know, everything else being the same. All you're saying is you're just literally what you've done is you've dropped, you know, the price of book A to nine with nothing else changing. And the price of that book is now 10% up by B. Now, now I think we are getting something. Now it feels like, you know, there is little room for error here. Like why, like, could this be noise? Could there be something external, right? Could, could there be that? Like, is this, should we assume that, should we assume that if it worked for A, that now this will work for all the books? Like that, that's now we, it feels like we're getting something. So let's talk about that. So this, uh, this is something else that I want to talk about, um, um, you know, and, and this is a little bit of math. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but, I'll try to explain in very simple, uh, very simple terms what this means. So this is a concept called statistical significance, or you can think of it as how much confidence does statistics give you that when you are doing, when you, when you observe a change, when you observe some effect, we talked about cause and effect, when you observe an effect, was that effect just random? Did that just happen without, without the cause or was it really truly because of the cause? That is your true causality, right? So that concept is called statistical significance. So Let's, so the question really, what we are trying to ask here is, we saw 10% lift in, in A, is that or is that just noise? Is that just variance? Like, would that have happened without us changing the price of the book A at all? How do we know? How do we guarantee? Right? How do we get confidence in that? Let's look at a similar question and a simple question. Suppose you had, suppose you flip a coin, simple coin, 100 times, 
and it gives you 45 tails and 55 heads, right? Which is a 10% difference between the two. The heads are 10% higher than the tails. It's a similar example. Is this actually heads bias or is this noise? Right? Is this, does this, does this coin that you have flipped 100 times, is this bias somehow that it lands on heads more than tails? Or is this just noise? Or is this just regular variance that any coin you tossed would actually, is likely to say 55 heads, 45 tails? Right? It, or, or anywhere in the middle. Is that, is that, how do you know when there is a 10% difference between the two results that that is random? Or is that, is that noise? Or is that actually because there is the coin itself has some, some flaw in it? That's the real question that we're trying to answer. So here, what, what, what this test does is if a certain number of flips will give you a certain number of heads, a statistic test or a statistical significance test will give you uh, an estimate of how confident you are that this is head bias. It's a number. It gives you the chance, the likelihood that this thing is head bias. This coin is head bias. So there is a calculator. I linked it here. And in this calculator, it says that uh, if you have minimum 56 heads and maximum 44 tails, which is a difference of 12%, then you can say with 90% confidence that this is head, head bias. But if you need a higher level of confidence, right, then you need more heads and, and less tails to, for, it to be, for it to be biased. In that case, if it, gets at least, if it gives you at least 57 heads and at most 43 tails, now, Im now, now imagine that the heads are increasing. 55 and 45 isn't getting us anywhere, right? It's not 90% confident. It is, it is with some confidence. The confidence will decrease. But as you, as you get to 56 and 44, now you're 90% confident that this, this coin is, is head biased. Now you want to you want to be even more sure about your business decision. You want to be ninety five percent confident. So then you say that it has to have at least fifty seven heads and at most forty three tails, and that gives you a ninety five percent confidence, a fourteen percent difference or fourteen percent lift between heads and tails, gives you that confidence. And and generally in in industry, the industry standard is to make business decisions on ninety five percent confidence. Uh, when you have at least ninety five percent confidence, you assume that. This is, you know, statistically significant. It's sound, um, and then you, you know, you move forward. That's not, that's not always true. You know, if you go to, for example, you know, surgical tests, like when you, when you, when you're testing, you know, surgery equipment, or when you're testing, you know, something that you need a very, very high level of confidence. You need ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the failure rate of that needs to be very, very low, because the cost of failure is extremely high. But in online marketplaces, in businesses, in tech companies. 95% confidence is supposed to be the industry norm. So that's what you go for. So in this case, um, in this case, again, using that heads, heads flip, right? The, the heads analogy, if only 100 books were sold and we saw a 10% lift, a lift of 10 can be variance. It's not good enough. You need at least a lift of 12. With a, with a confidence of 90% to say that when you drop the price for A, Right? You drop the price by $1, you have to at least see a difference of sales of 12 to say with 90% confidence that the drop in price is what has led to sales in A. And you need a difference of at least 14 to say that a drop in price, with, to say with 95% confidence that a drop in price has now actually led with 95% confidence to increase in sales of it. So I have a relatable example. Yeah, this is, this is kind of where you know, we are getting into it a little bit, but I hope that this is a relatable example. Can I ask a, a quick question? Some of the academic papers on marketplace experimentation have proposed that toy modeling or creating scenario models of uh, marketplaces could potentially be more effective than randomized controlled experimentation. What, what are your thoughts on that proposition from a, a practical perspective? Yeah. Uh... You can't, you can't, you can't simulate everything. You can't. <laughs> That's my answer. You just can't. Like if we are testing a new pricing, if, take this example. If you're testing a pricing model, uh, you can run, you can look at your historical data. So uh, I think that is, that's, that's a great point. I think that is the reason why I started with a very simplistic scenario where all books are sold at $10. If there was some price variation done in the past for this bookseller, then you could potentially look at pricing data and you could run some sort of an elasticity curve. You could plot, you know, at what price sales are sales, you know, how much does, how much does that impact sales? You could actually do that. 
and you could do some analysis. But guess what? That curve has to be robust across time. It has the sale, that curve has to stand, you know, in, in during your Christmas holidays. That curve has to stand during your book month. That curve has to stand during. So unless you have that level of depth where you have done this, you know, nine ways to Sunday, you know, and you are a very, very analytical company where you monitor sales and you're able to do that. Usually, usually the reason why companies test and do not rely on historical analysis is exactly that. What is what is going to happen now? Because the world is constantly changing. Why you test now and you draw an insight now and you launch it. You do it fast. Like that's one of the, you know, one of the tenets of failing fast, one of the underlying, underlying, you know, um, uh, you know, the 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 idea behind fail fast, you know, as people say, is experiment fast, learn fast, and launch fast. And if it doesn't work, pull back fast, right? But the way you do it, as I said, if you make a price change, you can look at historical data all you want, but that, that does not guarantee, uh, you know, take airlines as an example. Prices change for airlines in COVID, all, they were all over the place. How would you determine? You can, you can have elasticity costs from the past. How do you determine at what price point the, the airlines are going to get sold? The world just completely changed. So that is the reason why an emphasis on actually trying at a small scale like this, and then making a business decision at that instant in time. And by the way, that decision may or may not work in future, right? So, you know, that's why these businesses are complex because you have to come back and, and think through, think hard through whether this is something that we, that still holds or whether we need to do, you know, go and do something else that may or may not hold. But that's how you build it. Like, you know, card by card by card, brick by brick, you actually build that house. But the, 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 the thing is that you try. You try, you run a fast experiment, you get data very quickly, you make a decision, and then you actually move forward. So yeah, you can't test everything. You just yeah. can't simulate it. Yeah, that was where my thinking landed as well, that it's very difficult to forecast and predict the future and test, retest, retest is, uh, is, a, is a better model. I mean, there is value in forecasting, but everybody understands that forecasting is directional. Forecasting is based on historicals. It is not a true sense of, you know, it's not a true sense of uh, of what will happen in the real world. I will give you a very, very simple, I don't want to get, uh, you know, um, I don't want to get too negative here. But during COVID, a lot of tech companies hired because they forecasted that, you know, their, their business will grow, their demand will grow, etc. And now, as you may see, as right right now, when we're speaking, there are, there are a lot of layoffs. Um, those, all the hirings were based on forecasts, right? Demand forecasts sales forecasts and things like that, they, they expected the businesses to grow, but the reality is very different. And now people are unfortunately, you know, uh, seeing mass layoffs in the, in the tech industry. So forecasts will take you so far. Tests are the ones, that doesn't mean there is no value to forecasting. There is value in, in doing business assignment. There is value in doing portfolio management. There is value in doing, there is always value in saying, what do you expect to happen? Um, you know, and, and, and then actually trying to see whether you run an experiment, whether or not the way we do it at, at Shift, let me say it like this. Before we even run an experiment, we have some hypothesis. Um, when we create a hypothesis, we have something called an expected outcome, which is if we change, if we drop price, take this as an example, if we drop the price of book A, do what, what is the change in sales that we do, that, that we would expect? Now, in this scenario, you know, our bookseller is a very simple, it's a very simple business. They have never tested any differentiated pricing because everything was sold at dollar ten. But guess what? After this one time, let's say they they do this test, they launch it. Next time they have this data, so next time they would actually do differently, right? They they could fall back on these results at this time, this point in time, and actually use the results to draw some insights in the future. This could lead to a forecast in the future, to creating a forecast. So we, whenever we do hypothesis testing, um, any any experiment launch, we have something called an expected outcome, which is a version of a forecast. When we run an experiment, a small experiment, what is the change in metric that we expect? Either an increase or a decrease, depending on what we're testing. What do we forecast that, that, that metric to change? And then when we finish it, we actually see where we landed. Either we undershot or we overshot. So it's some sort of a forecast. Then. Okay. Uh, as I said, right, the one thing I want to take uh, that I would love for the audience to take away from this talk is this is the main technique that is used to make launch decisions in tech companies. Uh, the, the advantage here, as we saw through the previous analysis, if you saw a lift of 14%, the advantage is you, that is statistically sound. 
that is statistically significant and that is backed by a very, very high confidence of 95% that the book sales are, every 100 sales, if you see, you know, 14% lift for every 100 sales or a 14% lift overall, you would be, you would be, you know, uh, guaranteed that this is actually causing a, and by the way, as the sample size increases, if 100 goes to 1000, 1000 goes to 10,000, the number, that number, that 14% actually gets smaller and smaller. That, that's generally the way that works. So you can use that test calculator. I'll just flip back for a second. You can use that. It is a, it really just shows you out of the number of tries that you've had, how many successes did you had in your variant and in your control, right? A conversion rate. And if your conversion rate goes higher in your variant because of the change that you made, uh, is, that a, is that true? For, at what confidence level? Is that a true lift or is that just noise? You know, so that's what it is. And the bigger and bigger and bigger your sample size is, so take Amazon as an example, right? Amazon sells millions of books, for example. If they did this change, they would probably know, uh, they wouldn't even have to wait a week. They would probably know within 10 minutes, right? Whether, whether or not, because they have so much, so, so much sales coming through. Book, books are an example, but you know, take, take any general merchandise. So much volume coming through. Within 10 minutes, you would have enough samples where you would have seen, you know, uh, not even 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes, like ad systems, advertising platforms. They show so many ads. Within minutes, they know whether or not an ad is actually seeing enough user interest, whether the users are clicking on it or users are not clicking on it. Whether this is a good ad or this is a bad ad. They, they don't have to try too much. They will show that ad, like within minutes, they will show that, show that ad across the internet to millions of users. And within minutes, they know whether or not somebody's clicking on it and whether this is statistically significant. And all of this, by the way, is automated in these ad systems because they are constantly, they baseline this. They baseline this. If I'm other ads, good ads, bad ads, every time a new new strategy or a new ad comes into the market, they actually are trying to compare that with the baseline, right? So that's that's generally how it's done. So very very fast. When you when you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you don't need that interval to be fourteen percent. It can get much 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 smaller. Then you can make decisions. You know, is a zero point zero five percent. This was this was what I was reading in the OKR book yesterday. The measure what matters, where they the Google engineers were literally obsessed about raising the rate of YouTube views or you know a billion views per day by 0.05%. They already had such scale that if they raised it by 0.05%, that their uh, the scale was so high that they knew that that was happening because of a feature that they had launched. Even that small of a lip does not happen by 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 noise. It happens because of the cause. The effect is because of the cause that you actually did in the market. So just wanted to bring that forward. Uh, yeah. So here you can be very where you can be very confident that the difference in metric, if you use the right techniques, the difference in metric is a true change. It's not a false positive, it's not a false negative, mm -hmm. it's a true change. And because you are testing in the same scenario, both A and B are two books in the same store, in the same state, you know, in the same region, etc. external changes will actually impact both the books in the same way. If another book C was released, taking the previous example, some of the previous examples, if there was bad weather, one of the examples that we took, it could be bad. It would be bad for both A and B. If sales went down, they would go down for both A and B. Now you can do a relative comparison, right, between A and B, and and you know if sales went down for both A and B, but A is greater than B, then you know that you can do a relative comparison between the two. If guess what? If you know uh, in in California, if a celebrity releases a new book C, that would def deflate the sales potentially deflate the sales of both A and B equally. It doesn't mean that. Uh, you know, one would get, there is no reason to assume that one would get impacted disproportionately versus the other. So the relative comparison of launching a change on one versus the other, you're very, very confident in making that decision as long as, you know, the, as long as you're able to quantify that. Uh, the only, the only place where this, this does not work, this is coming back all the way to what we were talking about at the, at the top of the talk. It doesn't work when the variant can impact control due to network interference. And this is the primary problem in uh, in marketplaces, uh, where where you're doing comp where you're testing in a complex marketplace, where there are so many variables that are happening inside an economy, there can be network interference like this. That's the only thing. Any questions here, Gavin? Would love to see if any any you know any examples that come to mind that you have where you have used this term. Um, you know any 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 comments from your side? One thing that uh, came to mind for me was. Uh... As director of product, when you're thinking about testing big bets, how does your approach change with relation to the types of experiments you're performing 
and statistical significance when often you can be more looking for signaling and directionality early on? Yeah, I would say that regardless of how big the bet is, we always we always start very, very small. Always. That's just, if it is a big bigger bet, there is a bigger risk. Because if you if you take a bigger swing and you you know miss hard, that is even a bigger business impact, uh, a, 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 you know a business a, a bigger opportunity cost for the business because it takes longer, it costs us more to actually take a bigger moonshot. You even you want to be even more careful and you want to even figure out how how surgical can you be? How can you take the big bet and how can you really piecemeal it into very very small scale experiments? And by the way, you don't have to run all the experiments. Like in this example, you run one in California, you run one in Washington, you run one in New York. And then, you know, and then you kind of like, you know, you try different things in different markets, which kind of look similar. And then you kind of scale that up. So you run things simultaneously without potentially them interfering. Depends on what the marketplace is, right? In an online marketplace, you know, it may not matter whether your seller is in Washington or in New York, right? Like it doesn't matter. But in a, in a local, hyper-local marketplace like Ship, which is, you know, an Uber and Lyft, what you do in Washington is potentially different from, you can test Washington very differently from New York or Paris or London, for example, right? They're completely disjoint marketplaces, essentially. But yeah, but the, but the tenet remains, the bigger the bet, the more confident you want to be uh, that you are running more and more and more experiments, more and more hypotheses are validated. And, uh, you know, and uh, you are doing this bottom up. Generally speaking, Gavin, uh, generally speaking, right, product leaders, business leaders generally want to take baby steps. They generally want to crawl, walk, and then run, even for a big bet. They always want to take baby steps because the risk of launching a big bet can be so much for a brand. And it can, taking a full swing on a big bet can potentially be, not only be reversible, but it can be very, very detrimental to a business. If you actually launch something without having full confidence, it, it, may, not be, it may not be a situation where you are able to pull out from, unfortunately. So that is the reason why uh, you want to be even more careful. You actually want to give yourself more time to test. Like let it sink in. Like watch, watch your long-term user, be watch the user behavior over a longer term. Don't just give it a week, give it a month. Like wait, be patient, right? Because the bigger the bet, the more patience you need uh, with that bet. So that's what I would say. Uh, in all the companies that I worked for, right? Even at, even at Zynga, uh, you know, my previous company, we launched... Uh, a new version of a game, which was a very big bet for the company. We, I worked on a game called Words with Friends, which is where you play Scrabble. You're really playing Scrabble on mobile phones with your friends. Uh, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a very nice uh, sort of family connector, especially during the holidays, because playing Scrabble is, you know, classical thing that families will come together and play during the holidays during Christmas. Uh, we decided to completely, completely create a brand new app, which was a big bet for the company. You know, this app makes millions of dollars in revenue. We created a brand new app from scratch. But as I was telling you, right, uh, the way you do it is we, we started with the existing app and we started making a lot of small changes in the app, testing them. And then we decided they were big enough and we were seeing enough lifts that we actually wanted to move them into the new one. And the new one, by the way, there was a parallel effort and I, and I led that effort at the company where we were starting a very, very rudimentary app. We started a very rudimentary app, started taking that up, scaling that up slowly. And, and, you know, some of the other best practices from the existing app, some of the existing me mechanisms, leaderboards, you know, competitions, things like that, which we knew worked in that app, we actually migrated as is. But we did experiment with a lot in, the, in, the, in that app at scale. Uh, we, did, we did take that experimentation mentality. And slowly this, this bet slowly became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with all the learnings, micro learnings that we had in that. And then we created this big bet and then we launched the new app. And then as soon as we launched the new app, after a few, you know, after, after some time, we basically migrated all the users over and then we even pulled out the, the older app. But by the time we had enough confidence, and by the way, big bet, this bet went on for a year and a half. So it took us a long time to actually make that bet. That's how you have to be patient. And, and it gave us revenue. Like it gave us incremental revenue. It's not like we didn't see anything for a year and a half because, you know, the features were building and users were starting to go to the new features that they liked and we were promoting it and so on and so forth. So it started building up. At some point, we decided this was bigger than what we had and better than what we had, and we cut everybody over. But that's usually how we build. Yep. Good explanation. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, I think the 
last year's sort of we are coming to the tail end of the presentation. The biggest issue uh, that I would say, so A-B testing takes you very far, right? The previous example that we talked about takes you very far. But the biggest issue with marketplace testing in a small economy, in an n-sided, n-sided network, is something called statistical network interference. Um, and this, we talked about this a few times now. It happens when the variant will unexpectedly start to interfere with control, right? You don't expect it to happen, but it unexpectedly starts to interfere with the metrics. So in this, in our example, high sales for that, for book A can potentially, we were talking of an offline scenario, but let's just take that, you know, let's say that book A is, you know, is, is uh, um, let's say that the bookseller also has an online website, just for the sake of this, this conversation. Higher sales of book A can increase its rankings and popularity. Or even in an offline scenario, right? A sells a lot more. It's, you know, it, it goes into a lot of, you know, people's homes. It probably makes it into book clubs and so on and so forth. So the higher sales of A can increase its popularity, which can make people come, come and buy book A more and more and more. Right? There are many books which kind of organically, you know, Harry Potter, right? Like, you know, it became organically popular. Many people will come and buy Harry Potter more and more and more because it's more popular. But because of that popularity, it can start to cannibalize B, which is, remember what we were talking about, the seesaw effect? You don't actually intend that to happen. But because A is becoming more popular, it is now, and you know, a, a buyer will only buy a certain number of books in a month, for example, or, or a week. So they, if they are coming, everybody is now trying to, now starting to buy book A, it actually starts to decrease and cannibalize sales of B, which basically creates a cycle. Now B is not being popular, not becoming popular because it starts going off people's bookshelves. A starts going on people's bookshelves. So it creates this kind of vicious cycle where the, the metrics for B, the sales metrics for B are actually going down because there is an increase in sales metrics for them. And this is what I meant by, you know, uh, it can actually skew that CISO effect where it's not one-to-one. -one. It's not one-to-one, -one, unfortunately. That can happen. Uh, in practice, in practice, now this is where it, this is where it becomes, this is where the art meets the science. It's actually, it's impossible to avoid this in practice. And I'll give you, I'll give you, you know, one example, which I learned that I, I, I was scratching my head on it. This was a, this was a while ago. And I was like, that's true. I mean, it, it can go, you can take that down to a very, very deep level. So let's talk about that. So what if the sales of A are potentially, you know, causing longer lines in the store, which is actually reducing the sales for B. That can happen. Now A is selling more and more and people get, you know, people are with, so people who want to buy B are like, I don't care about this. I don't want to stand in line. I don't care about this. Like, I don't want to. So therefore, the sales are decreasing. How do you avoid this? You can't avoid this, right? If A becomes popular. Now, imagine if, if you drop the price. Like, let me, let me make a hypothetical just to bring the point home. If you drop the price of A to $1, or if you, gave, if you started giving book A for free, like if you drop it to $0, everybody would come in a checkout line to buy book A, like buy book A, right? Because they want to purchase book A. But then B is completely cannibalized and nobody is able to buy B because everybody's just looking to buy A. Nobody is able to buy B at this point. So that kind of creates a cycle, which is now A sales are looking through the roof. Well, the, the, the sales volume is looking through the roof. The revenue is zero, but the volume is looking through the roof and B is actually falling on the floor. And it is because of an effect that A caused on B. It's not because of the change that you, that's what, that's what, that is what interference is. And actually, when you take it to an online scenario, this is what, you know, uh, this is what, you know, was a, an aha moment for me early on when I was experimenting, uh, when I was getting into experimentation. So with that, let's talk about the last technique, uh, which is actually called switchback or time split test. Now, if, if for, the, for the sake of the audience, if you go and look at, uh, you know, the, the blogs of the newer marketplace companies like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Instacart, these are, the, these are the popular companies in North America. Uh, this is the technique that is sort of the, the you know, the, the latest, uh, your favorite child, if you will, out of all the experimentation techniques that we discussed. This is something that the companies are relying a lot on. Uh, what this does is, this is a technique that can help you get around marketplace interference, essentially. That is the reason why. The technique is very simple. It is a version of an A-B test. Right, where instead of you know you were you were actually splitting and compartmentalizing between a control and a variant, right? In in our example, 
B was control where there was no price change, book B. And then the variant was A, where, where you drop the price, the book A, where you drop the price by $1. What this is doing, and, and as we said, right, it could actually, the, the sales of book A could actually come and cannibalize the sales of book B, which would look like the sales of A are actually inflated versus book B, which would actually cause a problem in your, in your business decision making, essentially. This actually helps you get around it. And how does that do that? So the foundational idea is very simple. It is a way of, it is a fundamental way of EB test. Instead of doing it across compartments, you're actually doing it, instead of doing it across geographies, you're actually doing it across time. That's really what it is. Uh, so in this example, instead of only dropping A's price to $9 for one week, why don't we drop both A and B and switch it back and forth? So both A and B go to $9. And then they go to $10 during the week and $9 and $10 and one week in, one week out. It's a time split test, right? So it's going back and forth, switching back and forth between, between these options. That's really what a switch back is. Um, one way is uh, how to switch is if the what, one way, one typical way in which you would do this is uh, what if the price is set to $10 during weekdays and $9 on weekends, right? You could potentially do that. But a true switchback test is you actually want to randomize so that there is no time selection bias. Meaning, if the if the price naturally on on weekends was uh, was high, uh, the sales on weekends were higher, then you don't want to just keep switching price down to only on the weekends because that would not give you a true true result because that would just you know amplify the result that you already have in the marketplace, and again it would cause a problem. So. If you did that, if you only switched during weekdays to $10 and $9 on weekends, the issue would be, one of the issues with this would be that, uh, you know, customers who are coming both on weekdays and weekends will actually see price swings, right? Because, you know, because they are, because it's very reliable. Like on, you know, during weekdays, you're seeing $10. During weekends, now the same price goes to $9, $10, $9. So instead of that, what you do is you create time blocks and you randomly switch between them. So your weekdays is one time block. Your weekends is one time block and your $9 is one time is one is one variant and your $10 is one variant. And you basically are just like nine weekdays, nine weekends, nine weekdays, 10 week, you know, uh, weekdays, 10 week, weeknights, 10 or something like that. You're just kind of like switch, switching back and forth between different time blocks. So in this case, uh, what you could do instead of, instead of doing weekdays and weekends, what you could do is let's say if the bookstores are open every day between 11 and 7 PM, even if you just want to switch back within the same day to avoid cyclic, cyclicality between weekdays and weekends. If they are open between 11 to 7 p.m., about eight hours every day, uh, you divide them into equal blocks of four hours before and after 3 p.m. Let's just say that, right? And then you switch randomly. You say that in the morning, it's nine. In the evening, it's 10. The next day, in the morning, it's 10. Evening is nine. The next day, something else. It's purely random. You just purely are randomly selecting where what, ta- what value is applied. But the beauty of this is that the entire market is actually going into, uh, into the new test, into the, the entire, every, everything becomes a variant. So both A and B become a variant or they become control or they become variant or they become control. So now there is less likelihood of, uh, you know, A actually impacting B because both of them are now $9 or both of them are, are you know. So this is, this is the reason why, because it gives you this time-based, instead of a geo-based split, when you do a time-based split test, this is the reason why this is becoming very popular because it can actually help you get around market uh, get around market interference. And as a case study, I've I've linked a link here, which actually has is a, is a very nice blog from Lyft, which is a ride-sharing company in the U.S. Uh, you know, one of my former employers, which actually talks about uh, how they use switchback to work around interference in pricing experiments. This is the technique that that company used, for example. So. Again, TLDR, you know, hard to construct, hard to analyze because you have to now keep track of what blocks were $9. And you have to make sure that you are randomizing the $9, the $9 in enough blocks. It's not like you, if you only set $9 on weekends, but not on weekdays, then you're not likely to get a true unbiased result. Because, right? Because the, the sales on the weekends could be different from the sales on weekdays and so on. So that's truly what it is. It's a little difficult to construct, but it is, fairly robust because it is a version of AB test, which you are doing, you know, you are actually doing it on a time split basis. Uh, So I think that is all that I have on testing. 
I will add one final note on what is the difference between a test, an experiment, and an optimization, an optimizer. We'll talk about that. And then finally, you know, we'll talk about uh, some key insights, some key takeaways from the, from the presentation. And then, you know, what can you walk away from the presentation, uh, walk away with? So the main difference between what is an experiment and what is optimization uh, is that statistical testing or experimentation is generally used to choose a winner between many options, right? You, you're testing between A and B. You're testing a price of $9 or $10. That was a decision we were trying to make. Whether or not even between A and B, you're just testing whether the price should be nine dollars or ten dollars, and you're trying to choose a a winning a winning way a winning combination to 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 raise your sales. So that's what you were doing. But actually, optimization is to actually discover the true value amongst many options. So nine ten dollars, it could be eight dollars, it could be five dollars. You could get the highest sales at any at any of those values between zero to ten, or it could be eleven dollars. You could actually raise your sales could go lower, but your revenue. You know, but not low enough. A dollar higher would not actually, you know, would lower it enough. Where you would still see, you would still see a higher revenue. So the people's willingness to pay is actually higher. Something that you alluded to before, Gavin. So discovering that, and that is really the concept behind search pricing, right? Search pricing is, you know, it goes up, uh, and you know, truly tries to discover people's willingness to pay, and then it kind of comes down, and so on and so forth. Or dynamic pricing generally. So that is really in the realm of optimization. That's less of a test. And it's more of you know what numbers there are and you're trying to maximize a certain metric by tuning certain numbers. So that is more of an optimization problem. So the examples that, that, that I actually gave here, uh, you know, so optimization, what is the best price to, what is the best price to increase the revenue? $1, $2 or something else. The test that I, that, that I actually gave here at the end, the bullet says that it's actually not the, the that example I used is not the best example for A-B testing. It was just a representative example. Uh, it's truly, truly once you make that decision or you have to be able, you are able to make some decision, you can use it for some quick decision. Once you make that decision, you should really use it, you should really run it against an optimizer. You should be able to kind of tune those values, discover those values for you. You know, constantly trying to figure out where is the revenue maximized, uh, at what price point is the revenue maximized and constantly trying to test it. So that's not, uh, that's not to choose a winner amongst any options. That 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 winner might keep changing with time, and an optimizer will actually help you change that winner as time goes. If that makes sense, that is the main difference. A/B testing is good, very good for generally for things like making launch decisions, right? Which is you know, should I launch a new feature or should I not launch a new feature? This book sale is a is a it's it's a it's tuning a number. It's a tuning example, but I use it for you know for illustration purposes. But really, A/B testing is should I as I the example I gave you before, we launched a new version of a of a game, and a lot of those decisions were actually micro A/B tests, small scale A/B tests, and eventually we decided whether or not we want to club them and launch a big game or not. So that's where that's where the difference is. Uh, there are many, you know, publicly available optimizers out there in the real world. Uh, open source optimizers, Google as an optimizer, many optimization libraries that a lot of these companies will use for doing this kind of revenue optimization, forecasting, sales optimization, things like that. There are a lot of systems that scale that to this. Uh, and finally, I wanted to end the talk with some final thoughts and key takeaways. Uh, the first thought that I will, I will say over and over again is beware of interference and metrics inflation in marketplace experimentation, right? The biggest pitfall that somebody who's not well versed with marketplace experimentation, the biggest pitfall is you learn by falling, unfortunately, and it's it's costly to learn. It usually costs the company a lot of valuable time and money, uh, and 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 it confuses, especially new new PMs who don't have a lot of experience with experimentation. It confuses them a lot when they see why were the sales of my con why did the sales of my control drop when I did not make any change in control? It wasn't because of something external. It was because there was interference. Um, you know, other markets did not see this, but my market saw it. It's it's analytically difficult to parse, and you just at that point wasted a bunch of money and a bunch of time. You haven't reached the decision faster. So that's one problem. Second, I would I would say that although marketplace experimentation is complex, switch back switching back is complex. Keep it simple, right? Stick with something like an A/B test whenever possible. Stick with a decision test. Stick with something like an A-B test when you can potentially do a clean split. It's not always possible, but try to make a clean split and decide between two options as best as you can. 
right? So even if you are testing different price points, if you're testing, let's say, different subscription packages or values of the packages, make different packages, make different combinations, and then actually test different combinations and see what is conversion, what is user's affinity to convert into one package versus the other. Uh, instead of instead of trying to formulate that as an optimization problem, don't don't try to you know don't try to you know uh, run before you 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 figure out how to crawl and walk. That comes later. So you know figure out how to do A/B testing well, first and foremost, and then basically go from there. Um, learn some basic statistical techniques. Um, I want I, that's mis misspelled. I wanted to call stats techniques, um, which is you know things like what is a minimum sample size, what is the p-value. P-value is the confidence that we were talking about. With what confidence do you say that this decision is not noise and this is uh, you know a true a true lift in metrics? That's p-value. That that also gets into statistical power and significance. What is a confidence interval? What is alpha? What is beta? Alpha beta are your is your is your uh, probability of making a you know a, a, it's called a type one error or type two error, which is your false positive or a false negative. How do you not make false decisions when the data is Telling you something and something otherwise. There's a good resource here. It's a it's a it's a one small one page blog that somebody wrote. Uh, if you and it walks through an example. So if audience wants to refer to it, I highly recommend you guys to see how, in a different example, how that author has actually used sample sizes, p values, you know, uh, you know, uh, sample uh, uh, significance calculator and things like that. Uh, and and here's some practical here's some practical three practical tips. How long to run a test for, right? Usually you want to run it for what I call as the Goldilocks period. You don't want to run it too short. You don't want to run it too long. I mean, I gave an Amazon example. I gave some ads, ads companies example, which are at such a large scale that you would get an answer in minutes. And that's true. Like that, that is true for systems which are at very, very high scale and have been live for, you know, 20 years, right? Like ad systems were built a long, long time ago. Amazon was built a long time. But generally speaking, if you are running new bets, new experiments, that is a tuning experiment. But if you are running new bets, new features, I would say that run it for at least one business cycle. And business cycle is sort of what, what works for you, right? Sometimes a business cycle might be a week. Sometimes it might be two weeks. It might be a month. Like what is your cyclicality of sales? What is your cyclicality of the way you make you know, revenue or the way your users come back to you or whatever that may be, depending on what you're doing. So run it for at least one cycle, but but run it for complete cycles. Run it for two, run it for three. Don't stop at two and a half. Don't stop at one and a half. Because then you are going to get like the, the a business cycle is where you observe cyclicality. Across the cycle, you would observe patterns of cyclicality. Don't stop in the middle of a cycle. That's what I'm saying. Because then you would get, you know, half results are fully formed from weekend versus weekday data. It, if your cycle is a week and otherwise you're basically only looking at first half of the week, not the second half and all of that, that can get confusing. So don't do that. Um, I would also say that test it long enough and avoid, this is something that I, I mentor my, my PMs a lot. Try to avoid big test launch decisions based on positive results, based on all bias. A lot of times you, you launch features, you drop the price in this example and a lot of, buyers, book buyers would come and want to buy A. But guess what? That is probably going to fade over time, right? It's just because of, so So give it a minute. Give it, look look for, you know, don't just jump the gun because you saw metrics go up for one or two days. That's, unless you are a company like Amazon where you know that, you know what your long-term metrics are, you know, and you have, you have benchmarked them over a long period of time. Don't make decisions on that, that short of a time period, especially when you're doing feature launches. So give it at least, generally speaking, what I what I what we do at the company is we run things for at least two weeks. It gives us two full cycles. Our cycle is 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 uh, weekly cyclical. It gives us two cycles so that if one week goes off, we know that we have, you know, a way to sort of break ties. If it directionally is positive in both the weeks, we know that, you know, um, it looks positive. If one of them goes off, the other one doesn't. At least we know that we are not taking a an incomplete business decision. We might decide to run it for a third week, and that's okay. In, in order to break ties, but only running it for one week when there might be something external that happened because things can happen. It's something external that can, no matter what you do, as I said, right, it's impossible to avoid complete, it's imp impossible to compartmentalize completely against the real world. Things will happen. So run it for enough length of time, but not, but not so long that now you are starting to cross over into like a holiday or a long weekend when the cycle is not, it's not, it's not replicated, right? Like it's not the same as what happened before. Don't do that. So it's a Goldilocks period, not too short, not too long. A good 
rule of thumb, generally for feature launches, for product launches, for you know app app updates, for for any any anything visual, or or even anything that changes any user experience, generally two weeks. So run it for two weeks, uh, you know, and then go and uh, you know uh, take a business decision at the end of two weeks. Don't again avoid re- avoid novelty bias because generally that's what happens when you launch new features. A lot of earlier adopters are very passionate about your product. They would come and want to use those features, want to use those products early on. But if you give it a minute, if you give it a week, if you give it a couple of weeks, you will actually see that initial novelty tamp down a little bit. And that's where you want to measure your study state. Not when there is a high influx of you know uh, early activity. That's not where you want to benchmark your, benchmark your success. So. No, no peaking on early results. That is, that, I, that is a statistical term. Mm-hmm. You, you, don't, you don't want to peak. It's called peaking. Uh, so, you know, thanks uh, for bringing it to the, to the attention of the audience. No peaking on early results because, because the act of peaking, it's like, you know, the Schrodinger's cat, right? It's a little bit of, you know, quantum, quantum theory there, which is the act of looking at something actually changes the results or biases your opinion at what that result is. So don't do that. Run it. And, and usually your data science, uh, data science team or even the, the, the calculator that I showed you, that also has another calculator, which is a time period calculator. So assuming a certain conversion rate, let's say, you know, you estimate that if I, this is what I was alluding to before, Gavin, if you drop the book price from $10 to $9, you assume that the sales will rise by so much. Assuming that there is a certain conversion rate, how long should you wait so that you collect enough samples? How long would you have to wait to collect samples to make sure that you're 95% confident? That should be your testing cycle, really. Because before that, if you pull the plug, you, you, know, you, you made a decision on 100 samples only, that's too early. You probably need to wait for like 1,000 samples or 10,000 samples. And then beyond that, if, you're, if, you're statistic, if your confidence is high, even when the samples increase, your confidence is high and your, and your sales are high, you know that this is not noise. This is because of the cause that you did, that, that, has, that there is causality. There is an effect because of the cause. So I would, I would definitely say don't peak. Uh, don't peak and don't make you know don't make uh, don't make business decisions or launch launch decisions based on that. I will say from experience that I was, uh, I I I did not, I was mentored very early on from some of my some of my leaders saying that yeah the first thing that anybody gets excited when they launch is oh it looks great I want to launch this I want to launch this to all to all the users that's not how you do it you have to be patient. Right. So, so that's, that's, that's one takeaway definitely that uh, people should take, uh, you know, as part of this presentation. Um, I would say also just, you know, last two things to generalize to any geography or any nation or, 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 you know, all, all of your markets, you should ramp your geos one by one. If you're doing a geo-based test, or even if you are testing, even if you do a AB test, right, in a, in a certain store, you do a small scale test or a switchback test, like you, like you mentioned you run it in a certain market, you actually scale it to the state and then you scale it to the next state and then you scale it to the next state and then you, you, know, you build it up slowly as, as long as you have confidence that the results are significant. Don't just, usually don't just like try it here and then you know, just launch, do a big bang launch. If you, of course, if you're seeing results of the order of 20, 30% improvement, which is just something that you have never seen, it's possible sometimes that happens. It's something that you've never seen and you never expected at all because something clicked with your users. With the new experience that we launched, then you are then you want to recoup that you, you want to recoup that opportunity quickly. Then you want to launch faster, but but even then, right? Just for stability and the fact that your system could actually handle the scale as you bring more and more users into that feature, be patient, right? Like launch it, ramp it, ramp it over a period of time, ramp it geo by geo, and and go a little slow. Um, and again, um, I think that that was the the Goldilocks period kind of ties into the last bullet point. Make sure that you try to generalize. You, you run in a period of time that will generalize, generally speaking. Don't try to test on Christmas. Don't try to test around New Year's Eve. Like those are generally outlier periods for everybody in the world. So don't run tests around that and expect that to scale to all time, you know, to January or February. That's just not how the world works. So, you know, insulate yourself against these type of things. Um, don't have novelty bias. Don't run it short. Don't run it, don't run it too long so that it starts crossing over into weird time periods and ramp slowly. Be patient take a very, very sound business decision. Finally, I will, I will end by saying there is a book that I've linked here. I have, I get no credits for linking the book, uh, but this is by two Nobel Prize laureates. Both of them are economists. And uh, that is a book that talks about uh, really testing in the real world from an, from an econometric point of view. 
Uh, it talks about techniques like difference in differences, et cetera. It talks about some statistical test, testing as well, A-B testing as well. But it gives you a layoff, a very, very gentle introduction to different case studies, different examples of how these kind of techniques have been used in the clinics. That's what I would suggest. Michelle, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. There's so many insights for our audience to unpack. Um, it's been great chatting to you today. Thank you, Gavin. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. This was a fantastic conversation. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. And I would just tell the audience, uh, if you still have any questions or any concepts that you want to run by me, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Gavin, are there comments on the comments on the on the on the website where they can leave comments, or if they wanted to get in touch with me, uh, are there any pointers there? No comments on the website, so best to contact you via LinkedIn. Contact me via LinkedIn. That sounds great. Thanks again, Gavin, for having me, uh, and uh, you know, looking forward to more conversations in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. Great chatting. Thank you. That's all from this episode of Experimentation Masters. Just one more thing before we say goodbye. We can use your help to keep improving the show. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, you can email at gavin at firstprinciples.ventures. Visit firstprinciples.ventures for show notes, resources, and information. If you enjoyed this show, give us a share on social media. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Experimentation Masters, lead with more confidence.